Texas, the Lone Star State, where big isn't just an adjective, it's reality. Big things happen in Texas in these wide open spaces. But today we're at the big track with big cars and big tires, driven by powerful big engines. This thing is huge, and it's causing some big wide eyes as the IRL comes to Texas. The state's racing heroes are bigger than life, like the versatile Lloyd Ruby, or three-time Indy 500 champion Johnny Rutherford, or the grand champion, four-time Indy winner A.J. Foyt. Well, the boys are here. They're strapped in. They're ready to run. The ceremonies are already underway. And we are ready to go racing. Well, after a quick and final check of the circuit, we're ready to go here. The command to start the engines has been given. And each team raises a hand. One of the representative team members, that indicates to the race officials that we are, in fact, ready to run here at the Texas Motor Speedway. The sun begins to set over the main grandstand. And already a shadow lies across not only the front straightaway of this quad oval, but of the pit area as well. And very shortly, they'll roll out. If you're taking a look at some of the onboard cameras, that, of course, is Robin Buell, who starts on the outside of the front row in this most unusual qualifying procedure. Kenny Breck, who, of course, was involved in that incident before the start at Indy. Scott Goodyear, a little further back in the field. Finished second. And then Roberto Guerrero. And Mark Dinsmore, a little further back in the field. And Eddie Cheever. So we've got some great onboard cameras for you. We've got a lot to look forward to on what should be a very exciting evening. It should be, Paul, and you know, this is the most nervous time for the drivers. Just prior to that, gentlemen, start your engines. Now the engine is running. Those nerves are somewhat being reduced as the engine fires up. Indications that the Indy 500 winner, Ari Leyendijk, might be having a problem, Marty. We're by his pit, and all of a sudden on the radio, we hear that he had a battery problem and that he could not get fired. We're heading down there right now to see if they've got it fixed. Now, as we take a look at the number five Sprint PCS car, Ari Leyendijk is there. There's certainly no uh, furious movement. Nope, and there the car begins to roll away. So it appears that all is well with Ari Leyendijk, the winner of the Indy 500. And over in the pit area, you get a glimpse at the top of your screen. There's the balloon festival that begins here. The colors of the Texas Motor Speedway now float up into the sky. Now they used, as we indicated, a most unusual qualifying procedure here. What they actually had was three laps, two of them flying laps, and then on the third lap, you came in for a pit stop, made a two-tire stop, and then rocketed out and across the line. It was an attempt to put a little more action into it. It certainly did that, and it was an attempt to get the pit crew involved even more, and it did that as well. And so, we're going to show you the starting grid, but we'll show you their qualifying time, which includes the pit stop. But keep track of that other, the fast lap time. On the pole, it's Tony Stewart. His teammate, Robbie Buell, starts alongside. In row two, it's Kenny Breck. And Kenny, of course, tested here in April. He had a big crash. He's hoping to put that out of his mind as he starts today. And the 96 Indy 500 champion, Buddy Lazier. In row three, Scott Goodyear. And Greg Ray with a very nice run. The fourth row, Eddie Cheever. Who ran yesterday in the warm-up session a very high line. He thinks the high line will take him to the front. And the Phoenix winner, Jim Guthrie. He had engine problems in Indianapolis. He now has Menard Power. In row five, Idaho's Davey Hamilton and Colorado's Buzz Calkins. Ari Leyendijk is in row six. And the Brazilian Marco Greco on the outside. In the seventh row, Robbie Groff and Mark Dismore from Greenfield, Indiana. In row eight, Roberto Guerrero and Alfonso Tiafoni of Sao Paulo, Brazil. In the ninth row, Vincenzo Sospiri of Monte Carlo. And he is a guy, unfortunately, that has to start this race with a used engine. Team Scandia did not have enough to go around. And from Dallas, Texas, Alan May in his first ever IndyCar start. Then Dr. Jack Miller and Sam Smith. In the 11th row, Billy Boat and Eliseo Salazar. 
And further down, it's Johnny Unser, who is replacing Mike Groff, who had an accident here, and Fermin Velez. And then in the last row, Tice Carlson and Alessandro Zampedri. Now, Zampedri, unfortunately, does have a new engine, but team owner Andy Evans says, do not take it over 9,500 RPM. So now as they maneuver down the long backstretch, which is still in the sunlight, and there's the view as they come into the fourth turn. Now there's a little dog leg at this point. You look through the different onboard cameras and get a real good idea of the course. Yeah, and that dog leg creates quite a challenge because it narrows down off of four. It does, but if you look to the left-hand side, right now Kenny Breck was on the black pavement. That has been added since the Winston Cup cars ran here. They have a little more room. Of course, these cars are narrower than the stock cars. Shouldn't be too much of a problem. So as we're ready to take a look at the start of this race and they begin the pace lap, the Indy Racing League is ready to run. Its drivers set to go. And we'll be watching all the engines, the tires, and the chassis, and they'll be focusing on the championship at the end of the run. Now, one car had to come into the pits and make a change. Billy Boat is into the pits because we understand one of the balloons that we saw that were released got into the radiator, so they had to obviously take that out. He won't really have time to get back in his spot, Paul. Now, they're already aligned out on the backstretch going into three, into their rows of two, ready for a start. He's just now working his way up through turn two, but he can at least come toward this start on the fly as the field nicely aligned. The pace car rolls down into the pit area, and we're ready to run in Texas. Green flag, green flag. And as the green flag comes out, it's Stewart that jumps to the front. They feel their way around. Robbie Buell works up on the high line. And already they've gone back yellow because we got a big crash Marco over Greco. turn one, yeah. Marco Greco was spinning looking for other cars that suggested it was big. It looked a lot bigger than it actually was. But look at that smoke. That is probably engine related. The Scandia team has had all kinds of engine problems, and I think I may see some fluid at the back end. So Marco Greco may have blown an engine that soon. Let's take a look at it. He's the red car. Of course, there's many red cars. Let's see which one. There it is. There is the engine letting go at the worst possible time for a driver. Now the oil, see he tries to bring it down on the lower part of the bank, but now there's oil on the tires, and thankfully it does not look as though anyone else touched it. And that was something, I, you know, cars went everywhere, and you thought for a moment with all those tires lit up that we were gonna see a number of cars come off the wall, but fortunately Marco Greco's the only one involved. And behind the pace car now, the field circulates under yellow. Jack Miller has been delivered to the pits at the end of the tow road. They are going to work on that car. What can they change? Well, they can change pretty much all that they need, but uh, they are not going for the part of the car that would normally be the electrics. Marty? Guys, I don't know exactly yet what they touched, but they reached in, hit one switch, refired him, and he's back underway. Jerry? Well, Jan Bikas, your speculation about Alessandro Zampedri is exactly right. Talk to Dick Simon. He said, we have an overheating problem with the oil. He had to come in, take the side pod, and pull a baffle off, pull a piece off to get some more air in to try to cool it down a little bit. Otherwise, it should be okay. It's not okay for Dr. Jack Miller, though. He's rolled to a stop now just beyond the pit exit and in a uh, perilous position. They were hoping to go green flag at the end of this lap. I don't imagine they can do that with Jack Miller sitting down where he is because He's in a very exposed position, and in fact, blocking one of the exits for one of the safety crews. But it looks like they are going to go green because he is on pit road, so uh, he is somewhat shielded by the wall. Let's see if Buddy Lazier is as fast this time. The green comes out, Buddy Lazier, but take a look at the move. Kenny Brent comes down inside along with Robbie Buell. They almost touch tires as they head off through turn two. Now they string out. Buddy Lazier there had a little bit of a problem getting his car up to speed. I don't know if his lower gears are what he wants, but certainly not the kind of pace he ran earlier. Kenny Breck, man, he was just flying for the move on you. So at the front of the field, Stuart Lazier, Breck Fuel, and you look at the tire manufacturers with uh, that battle and the going on constantly. Look at this as they come three wide across. Whoa! 
very close against Buzz Calkins. I'm not so sure they didn't touch there. And that was Alan May. He's a new driver, comes from the Formula 4 2000 series. Those cars aren't as wide. Here comes Sam Schmidt on the inside of Calkins. And Schmidt grabs the spot away from Calkins. Calkins may be in trouble because now the rest of the field seems to be able to close up and get around him. Here comes the Foyt car. That's Billy Boat. Talked about his qualifying woes. There's Afonso Giafone in the brightly colored car, also making moves. And sure enough, here comes Buddy Lazier up front. Now finally he gets the speed rolling. Maybe he's got only high speed gears in that thing set up to run. Let's go back and take a look at that. Now watch the red car. Well, close but no cigar still. I'll tell you what, that'd get my attention. Yeah, that's one of those things where you see, you know, imminent contact and you make a little weave with the steering wheel. Back at the race for the front, Buddy Lazier, that purple car number 91, as he tries to chase down Tony Stewart, and he's getting that job done. Boy, he's handling the corner very well. Wow, he was really stuck there in turn three and four, and he got a great run on Stewart. Battle for third place comes by. The rest of the field now seems to string out. Sam Schmidt leading that pack. That's two blueprint cars kind of on the move there, right together. The yellow and blue car, Sam Schmidt behind him, Jim Guthrie. Those are teammates. Billy Boat takes advantage. So Boat said that he would move up, said that he was upset with the nature of the qualifying because of the incident that he suffered during qualifying, and he is very definitely carving his way up through this field. You know, this race should get better as the night goes on because the guys will be more comfortable running the high line and they'll get some rubber up there. Right now, there's some brave people trying it, but as more and more do, it'll be more comfortable for all the cars. And Billy Boat trying to make up for lost time coming up through the field. But he has a long, long way to go. We go back to the front of the field. Lazier. Doesn't seem to have gained much overall, though from time to time, especially in three and four, he seems to, to gain some on Stewart. But then Stewart's able to pull away through the dog leg across the stripe and definitely down the back straight. It's almost as if he has more speed, but he is now biding his time. He may have had radio communications from Hemelgarden saying, okay, now we know we have the speed, just stay back there and let's see what the, the pace of this race dictates. Fairly even laps at the front, both of them at 215 last time around. Stewart at 215.9. Look at this. Davy Hamilton on the outside of Dismore. Dismore, the 28 car, white and red. Davy Hamilton with that legendary number 14 that belongs to A.J. Foyt. And finally, by the way, Jack Miller. They get him restarted again and get him back into the fight. On board with Dismore. Let's see if he picks up any draft here. You can hear the engine pick up revs down the straightaway. Ooh, he's getting high up here. It doesn't seem to slow him down. They say if you run higher, it actually kind of frees the car up. Whoa, look out for slower traffic. That's oh, Eddie they Cheever. Around Cheever. What's Cheever doing down there and running so slow? Whoa, what a pass. <laughs> Whoa, and a car in trouble in turn two. It looks like Dr. Jack looks Miller. Looks like Miller again. Could be Alan May, their teammates, identically. And it looks like Schmidt got into the wall as a result of that as well. I wonder if that's a dropping of oil that got both those cars loose. And you're right, it is May. Very similar cars. But the 44 car, which was raced by Steve Kinzer in Indianapolis, now to this uh, local rookie, Alan May, who is actually looking pretty solid, except for that one near brush with Buzz Calkins. So here is what set this up as we go yellow on the 38th of 208 laps. Okay, this should develop in the, uh, oh, that was Alan May just losing it all on his own. Let's see what happened to Sam Schmidt. There's Sam. Oh, Sam gets down on the lower part on the eight degrees. And of course, when you don't have that banking, wow, a couple other cars getting very close to touching May. But unfortunately, Sam Schmidt just tried to get out of the way of May and got in the wall. I'll tell you what, that was very scary, especially as May came down off the bank. Okay, there is the spin and the contact, but right in through here, that is where the actual change in the banking takes place. That is what caught out uh, Sam Schmidt because there's just not as much grip down there. 
So we're back under yellow at the Texas Motor Speedway 38 laps complete as they get the debris from the incident involving the 16 car and the 44 car off the track. In July, boxing hits the big time with three world title fights. Oh, my word. Saturday, July 5th. No man can stop me. Steve Collins defends his WBO super middleweight title against Craig Cummings. Saturday, July 12th. Acumen is going down. Lennox Lewis makes the first defense of his crown. Heavyweight champion of the world against undefeated fellow Britain, Henry Aginwanda. And Saturday, July 19th. Prince Nassim Hamid against Pastor Morin. You've got to be saying I'm great. Big time boxing starting Saturday at 8, live on Sky Sports 1. Jukebox is here. If you're quick, you can get 200 original hits from the 50s, 60s, and 70s, the good old days. The songs are here together on 10 CDs for an amazing price. So get pen and paper ready. Mega Jukebox, a collection of hit songs that bring back memories at a price that makes you want to dance. Mega Jukebox can only be purchased from TV Shop, so call and order 200 hits on 10 CDs for an unbeatable price. Call now. Enter the world of Cart Door Chocolate Ice Cream. If you love rich, smooth chocolate, Cart Door will take you to new heights. Cart Door. With pieces of real milk chocolate. Cart Door. Tasting is believing. What was that? Only thunder. Treasure. So have I, Sydney. <gasps> Discover the lost world Jurassic Park treasures free with Tetley Tea. I remember the first time I used my limpid smooth. It was at the so-called Fashion for Peace show. Peace, more like World War Three. Tony Stewart out in front of this field, but reports now are that he's slowing down. There he is. He has not yet made a stop. We may have given you the impression that he had. He has not. Lazier came in a lap ago. Could Stewart be out of fuel? There comes his teammate, Robbie Buell, around him. Well, Robbie Buell's not going a whole lot faster. Of course, there is an 80 mile per hour speed limit, but of course, we saw that they were very slow. Jerry Punch, what's going on? 
Well, apparently Stewart is out of fuel. They, I, I asked him, I said, is he out of fuel, out of fuel? And they nodded their head up and down, and now the car rolled into a stop. It was not running. They will put all four tires on it. What a tough break. This is the kind of luck that Tony Stewart and Team Menard have had in 1997. Now he's off the jacks. They're going to try to get it refired. Fuel is down and away. They still have not refired Stewart's car. They try once, try again, and, and now he's looking the gear and pulls away. Marty? Guys, you want to see the problem with Kenny Breck's car? Jan, they don't know what caused this. This is the coil system, and it literally just blew. He's back out on the track, but he's several laps down. And Marty, what they have nowadays is they have one coil per cylinder. So they have eight of those. Obviously, he lost a couple of them. But remember, he said it was a big bang, and then he lost power. So thankfully, it was an electrical bang and not a mechanical one. Fight continues on the circuit. Dismore, Hamilton, Billy Boat, they all run together there. Now, remember, under our first caution, we saw all the Scandia cars come in. One of those was Eliseo Salazar. So he has not made a pit stop under this green portion because he topped off. So he's shown right now as our leader. So this is the battle at the front of the field. There was the leader, Salazar. He turns down pit road. That will give the lead over to Davey Hamilton, Scott Sharp. Yeah, very impressive. Uh, I think AJ chose to pit a little earlier on the last yellow, and that's paying off for them right now. Apparently, they have both cars working great, and it's good to see both the Seco and the Power Team car up there. Now, how is that with AJ as we watch the Salazar stop? AJ really you would think he really knows how to play the tactics and the strategy. Oh, he does. He's a bit of a gambler, AJ is. If there's a, a chance he thinks he might be able to pay off later in the race, he's certainly willing to take it. And uh, he just have seen, has seen it all before, so he knows when to make what kind of calls, and he's a good guy to have on the radio. Yeah, you see AJ Foyt there. He doesn't even have to think about it. His mind just clicks, and he knows, let's do this. Marty? Guys, I was talking to AJ before the race. He says, how many tickets did you bring for guests? He says, I have 300 Texans here, and we got to do good. But Davey Hamilton just radioed in. He says, the car is getting loose. Now, Marty, that is one of the things that everyone will expect here. As the temperatures go down, what happens is the tire temperatures don't stay up. And because the rear tires are wider than the front, that means you lose grip in the rear. Everybody's concerned about going loose. So during the pit stops, they'll take front wing out if they can. So H.A. Foyt cars running 1-2 here. But wait a minute. Take a look at this. As Jim Guthrie comes in here. Wow, Jim Guthrie's hooked up. And that would be, I believe, Sospiri in the old Navy car because Velez is out. So it does certainly look as though Hamilton must be big time loose because he's dropping through the field in a hurry. And we'll keep track on Billy Boat, who might have a similar position. No, he's able to come around, uh, come around Davy Hamilton and continue pursuit. But boy, what a fast move by Guthrie. And he came out of nowhere. He was sitting way back in third. Oh, no, oh. no. Not another engine. Keep an eye on a big puff at the back of the car. Scott, what do you think? I don't know. It's never good to see that. Uh, the motor's been running flawlessly, and AJ and K-Tech have worked so well at straightening our motor problems out. I sure hope that's not the case for Billy right now. He still seems to be up to speed. Definite smoke at the back of the car. Let's look again as he goes into number one. Uh, here it was. Jan, use that expert's eye. See if you can figure anything. Well, it certainly looks like it. Well, I was going to say it, it looks like it comes out of the exhaust pipe, but not necessarily. There could have been a little oil that kind of got over on a header or something. But boy, that type of puff of smoke is a big concern. Again, Scott Sharp, teammate uh, on the A.J. Foyt teams in the booth and watching this. And, and you're just kind of staring off into space trying to run all the probabilities. Well, yeah, you never know what it, exactly it is. Obviously, the motor must still be running good because Billy's out there. Maybe it was a transmission problem. Maybe he had a problem shifting up or shifting down in the gears. So Jim Guthrie, who had that spectacular run at Phoenix, taking the win there, is leading this race as he works around Alessandro Zampedri. And remember, Sam Schmidt was involved in that accident earlier. How's he doing now? Well, Paul, we, we caught up with Sam back here behind you. Oh, Sam, we've got to stop meeting like this. We met in the early laps at Indy a couple of weeks ago, and now here in, in Dallas, you were caught up in an accident. How did that happen? Well, it's, it's really disappointing because we were running so good. I mean, the car started out a little bit loose, and, and then it just got so neutral. It was beautiful. Last three laps for 212, and I just went into one, and I saw the smoke, and uh, Smodder said inside, 
and it was just totally smoky, so I just, just got it just below the yellow line and just took off, lost control. It was really disappointing. The guys from Hope, everybody's here, but uh, we had a good run going. I mean, we were just riding it out. The car was perfect. Whoa! And Tim Petri gets it in trouble in the leader of the race as he comes across the line. I think a tire exploded, Paul. I think the right that rear right tire. right rear is a mess. I think the right rear tire just blew up. We can hear it here in the booth. It was a blowout. Uh, that is one of the scariest things that can happen to a driver. Thankfully, it happened on the front stretch. And thankfully, Jim is waving back to the pits. He appears to be okay. And the cockpit has its integrity, but boy, look at the right rear. And that thing just let go with a big explosion. You don't hear that very often. And a lot of times that comes from a cut tire. There are the pieces of the tire that is leading into what they call the dog leg just before the start finish line. Maybe he hit some debris. And boy, that thing let go. That, that's a scary moment. Well, as the safety crew is there with him, he's obviously all right, but uh, seemingly confused as what happened. Here it is, Jan. Watch this tire, which would be on the left of your screen, the left rear. There it is. It just explodes. My, oh, my. You could not explode a tire in a better place as far as, I mean, you never, there's never a good place, but if there's any place to do it, do it in the dog leg to where the car is going to have minimal damage. Yeah, fortunately, there's a piece of straightaway here that gave him plenty of room, and he kept the car fairly straight off the end of the dog leg and down toward turn one. I'll tell you, that was a huge surprise for him. I mean, this is a place you would never expect the car. You can just see that thing unravel. We are situated in our broadcast position about seven stories above the track finish, just the track surface just beyond the uh, start finish line and you can hear it through the glass up here when it oh, let yeah. go. You can hear the boom. Well, we're very definitely at nighttime now and these cars just sparkle under these lights, Jerry Punch. Paul, let me show you how some of the teams have devised by using the Tuesday and Wednesday night practices to be able to see here when it got late. Now, this is Roberto Guerrero's clear shield I have on the top here. The clear shield is fine. It's very, very good visibility. However, the contrast between looking up in the stands and the light reflections did cause some reflection and some glare. Now, he tried this amber shield, which a lot of people use if you're a, an avid hunter or you shoot a lot at shooting ranges. You know that the amber shield gives you increased visual acuity because it lacks some of the glare and takes away a lot of the transition between high density and low density light with this amber shield on he could see with very very dim light and of course the acuity very very important he found that out Tuesday night as did another a number of other drivers that's why many of them have gone from the clear to the amber for night racing the true value 500 K 312 miles the stop should be done for everyone we should be set to go green and Billy boat will be lined up right behind Tony Stewart should be a sprint Whoa. run and wow look at him dodge to miss a slower car as they come back. Bryce Carlson wasn't getting up to speed there and my that was a close moment. They come up to speed off of turn two. Billy Boat, Tony Stewart, they begin a battle now. These two guys who have similar backgrounds. Lion Dyke got down below the yellow line there, got in trouble. Lion Dyke is trying to get a lap back here. These two guys, the White yellow car of Stewart right behind Billy Boat. That's for the lead. So Sperry pulls aside to let the battle for the lead come on through. He's not a factor in this fight right now. Robbie Groff sits in third. Davey Hamilton sits in fourth. Battle for the lead goes down the back stretch. Now, if I was Billy Boat, I would want to get in there and I would really want to push on Stewart to see if I could get him to blow up like we saw with Robbie Buell. Remember, they can run fifth or sixth gear. And if Stewart feels comfortable, he'll stick it. Oh, oh no. no! Robbie Groff. Smoke at the back of the 30 Team Losi Alpha Laval car. And it looks like it's over. What a great ride he gave that car, though. They can be proud of this one. They can be proud. Robbie can be proud. Uh, you know, that's the first thing you have to do as a rookie coming in is show your speed. And then as the equipment gets better, obviously you hope that doesn't happen. Jerry Punch. Well, now Robbie Buell becomes a spectator and a cheerleader. He's been cheering and clapping each time Tony Stewart came by. Robbie, you gave it a whale of a run. What happened? Um, we just picked up a little bit of a miss in the motor, and then obviously it started smoking. But up to that point, I mean, the car was great. I knew we had a good car yesterday, and it just got better and better as the race went on, and the whole crew did an excellent job. Any warning at all? He's 
said it was missing a little bit. Did you know it was going to go when it went? Yeah. Uh, the car picked up a, a little bit of a noise probably 10 laps prior. We weren't seeing no RPM, and then she let go. Or, yeah, I don't even think it let go. I think just something broke. Ordinarily, a driver goes to the garage area, but you don't want to miss this finish. Well, Tony's running a good race. My car was only getting better. Unfortunately, I think this could have been a one-two finish for us. All right, Robbie Buell now out of it, but he gets to cheer on his teammate, maybe to his first win of the year. But well, Tony Stewart certainly has pride in us as again you look at the tire manufacturers and again with the Lion Dyke presence coming back toward the front of the field. Firestone uh, continues to lead but breaks in to an advantage held by Goodyear for a while there. Still pretty even across the start the, the entire group of the front order here. Let's take a look at that restart coming out of the last yellow one more time and all the weaving and bobbing that went on there. Very close, obviously, between Stewart and Boat. That was Tice Carlson, who we know has been into the pits for repairs. He didn't get up to speed, and that was a slow-mo replay. In, in real time, that thing was, was closer than it looks. So Tony Stewart looking at perhaps his first victory. Well, there are two A.J. Boyd cars behind him who would like to contest that possibility, and you can't discount the fact that A.J. is here, he's got a lot of friends in the crowd, it's not all that far from his home. It's very important for him to do very well here. So, you know he's going to pull out all the stuff. Robbie drop out so early, Jerry Punch. Well, Paul, from 21st tonight, did Andy from 13th in the lead here, Robbie, what an effort. Well, it was fun while it lasted, and the car was great, and, uh, I tell you, Brayton Engineering has always given us a great engine. Nothing's changed. You know, you think you're immune to some of the, you know, the new engine problems here with IRL. And, you know, tonight, unfortunately, it bit us. But the McCormick Motorsport Alpha Level Team Losey car was great up until the time the engine expired. So what can you say? You know, I drove 100 percent. The guys did 100 percent on those things. You had to have a big cheerleader watching from a hospital bed back in Indiana. Yeah, that's right, Mike. I miss you, and uh, can't wait to come back. He really wanted to win this one for Mike. At least have a good finish, but it's over here with just a few laps to go. Paul. Well, Tony Stewart's handling them all up now in his Glidden number two car. John Menard's entry into this race. His teammate, of course, the Quaker State car, Robbie Buell, is out of the run. Now, what we're going to do is look back through the field for you, and we'll look for Billy Boat, who's right there, the blue and white car. And we're looking for Hamilton. Baby Hamilton, the orange and white number 14, and there he comes. So that's first, second, third. Ari Leyendijk is a lap off the pace in the number five car, the Sprint PCS car, trying to find a way back onto the lead lap so that he can join this car. Davey Hamilton sponsored by Power Team, which is actually a wholesale distributor of electricity, which I think they're using a lot of electricity tonight on these lights, Paul. I'll tell you what, it is a beautiful setting. Watching these cars run at night has been a wonderful experience, especially when you see stuff like you just saw there. As he feathered out of the throttle a little bit, you can see the bright blue flames of the exhaust because it's obviously a bit dimmer. We ride with Scott Goodyear. The pit stops are all done. We move to the final 10 laps of the True Value 500K at Texas Motor Speedway. It's been an interesting run, somewhat disjointed. A lot of action at the track here. Some engines being the cause of some frustration for a number of the teams, most notably Team Menard, who had Robbie Buell's engine let go just a few laps ago. And so that sets up the True Value field summary at this moment with the two Foyt cars trying to catch Stewart. Billy Boat being the one who perhaps can. But he is right now well off of Stewart. The real question is, can Tony Stewart's engine make it to the end of this run? The Glidden car is Stewart. He has led all but one race in the IRL. There he goes under Johnny Unser, who is replacing Mike Groff in the car, and it looks like he is doing exactly as instructed. Don't be crazy. You don't have to show me anything. 
except get it into the top ten. Jonathan Bird, the owner of the car, was very clear on that. And Unser is sitting at eighth right now. And of course, Johnny wants to just bring this car home as well. He has one of the only three Nissan Infiniti engines that were entered in this race. And his best career finish in the IRL is a ninth. So he's hoping to maybe better that today. Well, Billy Boat is the key as we watch for him looking at Goodyear there. Goodyear, you can see running down seventh place. Unser actually in ninth. So in a tie for his his best ever position, but there's there's some room for movement here yet. John Menard hands on hips, watching as we count down into the final laps. Five to go now. This is a nerve-wracking time for an owner. At least a driver is out there standing on the pedal. Uh, nothing an owner can do right now but just pace. You know, it's it's old, it's trite. We've all said it at least once about a driver at this point in the race hearing everything. But you know, a couple times recently I've just heard exactly that as they climb out of the car. Most notably, Jim Guthrie at Phoenix said in those final laps, he could hear the wheel bearings scraping against each other. He could hear every cylinder going. You wonder if that's not what Tony Stewart's feeling right now, too. He's seen Robbie Buell's car go. He knows what happened there. He's heard the orders of his team. He knows victory is within sight with three to go. But still, he has to wonder and wonder and wonder. Did the one car just slow a bit? Let's watch his line through three and four. He looks up to speed at this point. been balked just a little bit in traffic. Tony Stewart certainly at, at this moment looks like he's he's on. Oh, oh and there oh, is exactly right. what they worry oh. about. Stewart, the engine lets go. He catches the wall. Billy Boom will take the lead. But Billy has to get by him yet. Unbelievable. Just exactly what we feared. Tony Stewart cannot make it to the finish. The engine, despite every effort to save it, Let's go. John Menard has to be struck. Marty? Do you think that you will ever get a break in this? I know it doesn't seem that way, does it? It just seems like uh, we're so close, and every time we get closer, right now I'm just worried if Tony's okay, and you know, darn it, I just, uh, I don't know what to tell you. Well, Marty, you can tell him he appears okay. We can tell you, they're telling us up in the booth, he appears to be okay, so that's good news. Good, good. Um, Tony just ran a wonderful race. Uh, you know, we're so close. We get so close. And uh, I don't know. You know, one of these days we're going to make it all the way. But uh, just a few laps. Three I'm, laps. I'm just from glad that uh, he's okay. I, you know, that's all I care about. <laughs> uh, unable to. I can't believe you can get a smile on your face, John. So, John Menard's team, they do bring out a stretcher for. Uh, for Tony Stewart will keep track of that but he appeared to be moving in the car and actually talking to the rescuers uh, well, they get him out and lay him down uh, obviously he's moving and he <laughs> doesn't seem like he wants to lay down and Billy Boat driving for A.J. Foyt will come around and see the white and yellow flags together Davey Hamilton will sit in second place and A.J. Foyt in front of the Texas crowd is going to go to a one two finish in just a mile and a half. Unbelievable. Who would have thought? I mean, Tony Stewart was just cruising around. Here he is. He's in whatever gear it is. He's trying to save the RPM. He knows his teammate had trouble. Across the finish line. I mean, Paul, you said you hear things in the engine. You hear things in the car. I mean, he heard something here, and it was real. And that was the last thing that he wanted to hear. And unfortunately, right here, Oil he's got oil on the, on the tires, and yeah. he's just a passenger here. Nothing you can do. Not super heavy contact, but remember, you're still going 200 miles an hour here. It's still a pretty big hit. So Tony Stewart out. He'll have to make a trip to the uh, medical center here and get the clearance of the positions. And now the uh, John Menard reaction at exactly that moment as he watched his car. Uh, I think we know what he said there. Oh, but how sad for them. Oh, yeah. How terribly sad. And it was predicted. So now, look at this. 
He's going to do it. A.J. Foyt is going to finish first and second with Billy Boat and Davey Hamilton. They make the turn off the final corner. They come to the line, and the tear of the West Coast Midgets has taken the win here in the True Value 500. His teammate, Davey Hamilton, will finish in second. What a run that was. Marty? Well, well, 300 tickets. It must have been worth it. It's, huh? it's great. And I'll tell you what, we named that car Christine. She hurt three other drivers. It's finally glad to just see her do something. Did, did you ever think that it was going to come down like this? Well, we were pushing the front end. I told him back off and just hang on for a second. We weren't trying to trophy dash. We're just thrilled to death. The whole crew deserves this very much. This guy wants to get to victory lane, guys. I can't blame him. Billy, congratulations. This has to be a dream come true. You know, after being last, I was just thinking, you know, I just like to, I just know I had to take the Foyken Seco car, be steady. I know I had a good race car. You know, you, you got to finish first, you got to finish, and uh, we did that today. It was just a great victory for this whole team. They really deserve it. But these weren't the only fireworks. Harry Leyendijk thought he'd won the race. The officials had docked in two laps. He walked towards victory lane, and a punch-up with A.J. Foyt ensued. Afterwards, officials declared that, in fact, Leyendijk was the winner, and there will be an official inquiry in which A.J. Foyt will have to attend. Well, that left the final result like this. We'll be back after the break. <laughs> 